talk about some fun, interesting science, and also have a think about um, where we're going in the future. So um, Sean and I are just going to start off with a hopefully quite brief presentation. I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the history behind the group and some of the um, activities that we've been involved in already. And then Sean will talk a little bit more about more recent uh, activities and um, going into the future. So um, yes, we are the WAPSA working group. Uh, we're one of the regional working groups of the Southern Ocean Observing System. And you can see in the map here, this is our region. So this is, um, we, we de we'll, de we'll deal with the West Antarctic Peninsula and Scotia Arc and into the sort of South Atlantic region. Oop, hope that gets to work. There we go. So um, at the moment, uh, the co-chairs of the group are Oscar, Sean, myself and Juan. And um, the group itself was actually started in 2016 and sort of formulated um, properly in 2017, originally as the WAP working group. And we've now expanded to include the Scotia Arc as well. And here's just a full table of um, all the uh, different uh, people involved in the leadership group. Um, so you can see um, people from uh, all around the world, from different um, subject areas and um, different institutions. Um, so we have got listed up here, um, not only the co-chairs, but also some of the members that we've got um, joining us from the XCOM and um, Scientific Steering Committee of SUSE itself. So um, we really sort of kicked off things in 2017 with a couple of really exciting meetings that were held in the UK. Um, the first one was held at the uh, British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. And um, this was quite a big meeting. We had nearly 100 participants. And um, you can see the goals of the meeting listed there. But briefly, the idea was to try and sort of think about what the key scientific questions were surrounding the West Antarctic Peninsula and to share information about some of the existing programs um, from an international point of view and how we can you know, potentially bring those uh, programs together. And um, we then sort of went on to think about how um, the WAP Regional Working Group of SUS could really sort of be constructed um, around these activities to try and um, make the most of, of, of what we have really in terms of um, um, existing programmes. So um, we came away with lots of really fantastic ideas, lots of information, and um, you can see there's, well, there's lots of text up here. I'm, uh, I don't expect you to read it all, but um, just sort of some of the key take home messages. Um, well, we came out with, with a lot of the important big picture questions and um, the scientific issues that really sort of cross all scientific disciplines, really focusing in on things like complexity and um, the um, different spatial and temporal scales and how the Western Antarctic Peninsula is actually really patchy, both in space and time. And um, so what, you know, what are the challenges in identifying these, um, the processes behind this um, spatial and temporal heterogeneity? Um, we talked a lot about long-term solutions, so the importance of um, long-term monitoring, um, bringing nations together, uh, improved data availability and sharing, and um, in engagement with different um, groups of people, uh, different organisations, different disciplines, um, and potentially even engaging with um, other stakeholders and uh, citizen science. Uh, so we came up with some immediate priorities as well, some of which we've sort of dealt with in the intermediate, uh, intermediate time uh, that Sean will talk about. And um, the outcomes of um, this meeting are actually now published in um, a report um, that's available through the SUS website. So the second meeting was a lot smaller, a bit more targeted, um, and it was um, a scientific meeting that was funded by the Royal Society in um, a beautiful location uh, in, uh, in the countryside of the United Kingdom. And here are the group of people who were, who were there. And um, this was really focusing quite a bit more in on um, specifically biogeochemistry, but also the sort of physical drivers and um, biological drivers of um, nutrient cycling along the West Antarctic Peninsula. And you can see the, the list of overarching questions here that, um, that the meeting talked about. And um, I guess the sort of um, summary of the meeting um, you can see here. So the broad observations that we made were again sort of focusing in on this spatial and temporal variability along the West Antarctic Peninsula, a lot of which are driven by physical processes, including, including sea ice. 
Um, we also need to not only understand the processes that are controlling um, such variability, but also their, their rates really. And a lot of this is, is um, very much understudied. Um, and then, you know, we talked a little bit about um, how we can break down barriers in order to help um, address some of these um, questions that we have. So again, using um, data in a better way, using national programs in a more um, connected way. Um, and um, better integration, really, between um, different disciplines. So as I mentioned, uh, all of this has now come together in a report that's available from um, Southern Ocean Observing um, System website. And it's a citable report now that you can also find on Zenodo. So there's a, there's a link there if you want to download that. And the other outcome really from um, these meetings um, was a compilation of um, papers in, um, oh, sorry, it's been cut off a bit there, but it's in a special issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society A that was put together by myself, Mike Meredith and Hugh Ducklow. So there's um, uh, about a dozen papers there on a mixture of subjects from physics through biogeochemistry through to biology. Um, and it's really focusing in on this, this subject of oceanographic variability along the West Antarctic Peninsula. So um, I suggest you check that out. Okay, I'll hand over to Sean now, I think. Thanks very much, Kate. And hello, everybody, um, wherever you are in the world, whatever type of room you're in, be it an office, a bedroom, a front room, um, sending greetings to you from my front room. Uh, so yeah, to pick up from uh, where Kate left off, what we did after the uh, Philosophical Transactions special issue is we moved forward to the publication that you can see hopefully on your screens just now. Uh, and the aim of this paper was really to uh, provide a synthesis of what we know about the, the WAP system at present and what uh, research directions we would like to move in going forward. So we set out to address two overarching scientific questions surrounding the key mechanisms and interactions regulating ecosystem functioning and ocean atmosphere coupling along the WAP shelf, and then thinking about how this environment is changing and what the ecosystem responses are to these changes and what ocean climate feedbacks we can expect in response to the changes underway. And for each of these questions, we considered uh, the full suite of components of the system from ice dynamics through physics, through biology, biogeochemistry, as listed there. Uh, and we really tried to incorporate each of these components into answering the two major questions. And then finally, we moved on to considering what the priorities are for future work. And this was not intended to be a shopping list of all the fun stuff we want to go and do, but a more kind of overarching viewpoint and integrative viewpoint for the entire community. Uh, so yeah, if you can change slides, please, Kate. Yeah, so we started with this diagram that was expertly drawn by Carlos Moffat, who is with us today. Um, and then I took the liberty of scribbling all over it to add uh, what we considered some of the, the major long term ecological research projects going on along the WAP. There are many others that unfortunately, due to the scale of the diagram, we couldn't include, but we tried to give an overarching perspective of the amount of research going on in the WAP region. And what we really aim to show was that this is one of the best observed regions of Antarctica, perhaps even the best in terms of the amount of data available. And this combined with its position that I'm sure I don't need to explain to this audience um, of this region as a place of very rapid climate and oceanographic change, uh, as well as pronounced internal variability superimposed onto those longer term anthropogenic trends. So those two things between them make the Antarctic Peninsula really a model system and a very useful tool for examining how sea ice changes can restructure polar ecosystems both here, elsewhere around Antarctica and potentially with relevance for Arctic systems as well. 
and we also wanted to kind of celebrate the um, the importance of the WAP shelf ecosystem for um, biology of all trophic levels, both regionally and much further afield, uh, in order to make the argument that changes occurring in this region are not only important here, but they're very important at the larger scale as well. Uh, next slide, please, Kate. So we started with sea ice as the, the primary responder to uh, ongoing climate change and a primary driver of many of the other processes and phenomena that are changing. Uh, so I'll uh, just glance at the clock and be brief. Um, what we did with these two diagrams was to show the statistically significant increases in winter atmospheric temperature and reductions in the duration of the sea ice season. Uh, with uh, a lot of variability and complexity along the way caused by short-term natural variability superimposed onto those longer-term trends. And it's really these two things between them that, um, that control the sea ice dynamics of the region. And in turn, these sea ice changes are closely coupled to the physical oceanographic changes along the way, about which we've got lots of great talks this afternoon or this morning or this evening. Um, and then we, we make the argument through the rest of the paper that these physical changes have myriad and cascading effects through the entire system at all scales in both um, time and space. And they, they cascade through phytoplankton community dynamics, biogeochemistry, air sea exchange, and the functioning of the entire ecosystem. Next slide, please, Kate. And this is my final one. So at the end of the paper, we come to this, uh, this diagram, which is intended to show the, the processes and things that we know are important in the, the circular formation around the WAP, and then kind of spreading out into the major processes and phenomena that we really need to get to grips with better. We really need to improve our understanding of, both in terms of the way the system is functioning now and the major drive of that system, and how we can, uh, can expect that system to change in the future. And then the, the blue outer rim of this diagram shows the um, approaches and the technologies and the methods that we need to use in order to make this progress. And really the key point is that future re uh, research requires international cooperation collaboration and integration across the disciplines. So we need to extend the existing time series as well as adding new ones. We're going to be looking more and more at incorporating innovative technologies to fill data gaps in time and space. Uh, we are advocating for comp complementing these time series with process studies so we can really get at the, the mechanisms driving the change. And then there's a great appreciation that this ever expanding body of data that we're generating needs to be incorporated into increasingly complex and sophisticated models in order to give us um, confidence in our predictive skill going forward. So we also advocate for standardization of approaches wherever possible to make sure that data are comparable across different projects, studies, uh, national programs, etc. Uh, and we really urge the community to open up all data sources as much as possible. And these, uh, the reason I, I focus on these points here is that these are very much in line with the objectives of the WAPSA Regional Working Group, as Kate introduced, uh, and, uh, and of the Southern Ocean Observing System as a whole. So as part of those efforts, they have the SUS data portal, SUS map, for which the address is on the screen there, which is a, a data portal which highlights all of the publicly available data sources throughout the Southern Ocean. So well, uh, well worth a look. Um, right, so hopefully that gives you a very uh, quick introduction to the sort of broad scientific context within which we're working and some of the goals that the regional working group is trying to work towards. Uh, and I now hand back to Juan to. Uh, take over the rest of the session. But before I do, on behalf of Kate, Oscar and myself, I would like to publicly thank Juan for all of his work in bringing this workshop together because he really did the 
majority of the work in coordinating and controlling the tech. So thank you, Juan, on behalf of us all. Thanks for, for the kind words. No, it has been a, really a group effort and all the people that you know, are here today with us. So thank you to all. And now uh, we are moving to the first uh, talk. So uh, Ang is giving the, the first talk. So if you can share your screen. Uh, any problem with trying to share the screen, Anne? Yes, so I'm getting a pop-up box that says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, let me... Uh, so. Okay, one second. Uh, can you uh, do it now or not? Still no, unfortunately. Now? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, Excellent. sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> now uh, I will leave the floor uh, to Anne and uh, she's going to give a talk uh, from Pew. Thanks for Oops. being here. We really are looking forward for this talk. And uh, the talk is about protecting Antarctica and uh, marine protected areas. So here you go. Wonderful. Thank you, Juan. And um, thank you, Sean, for inviting me today to speak about the work that Pew is doing in the Southern Ocean, uh, in particular, our conservation advocacy work in the Antarctic Peninsula and Scotia Arc region. My name is Ann Christensen. I work for the Pew Charitable Trust Protecting Antarctica's Southern Ocean Program in Washington, D.C. My background is conservation science and environmental policy, and I'm currently also in the final months of my Ph.D. in natural resource use and climate adaptation. I'm also joined by my colleague Rodolfo Werner, who is a marine biologist and the senior scientific advisor for our Southern Ocean work. So I'm going to start with giving just a brief overview of Pew's environmental work before di diving into the Antarctic Peninsula Marine Protected Area and our advocacy and research in the region. To start off, the Pew Charitable Trust is a large nonprofit based in the United States, but it has offices around the world. We have two branches, the Pew Research Center, which conducts independent research and surveys, and it's completely separated from our policy and advocacy programs of the trust, uh, of which our marine environment makes up the largest single issue area within the organization. Pew has been working on Southern Ocean conservation issues for over 12 years. Recently, this work has been in coordination with a growing number of partners, including first and foremost, the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, which has official observer status at CAMLAR and is made up of many national-based NGOs, as well as some larger NGOs like WWF and Greenpeace. Lastly, we work with numerous researchers providing financial, technical, and communication support for research in the Southern Ocean, from tracking penguins to underwater surveys of vulnerable marine ecosystems. So the Southern Ocean team that I am on, we have five overarching goals that drive our work for this year and for 2021. Our primary advocacy is in support of CAMLAR's objective of creating a network of marine protected areas around Antarctica. We also play an active role in pushing CAMLAR to adopt ecosystem-based krill fisheries management. In addition, we're working on issues such as integrating climate change considerations into CAMLAR decision-making and also drawing attention to issues around transshipment. All of these goals are supported through our extensive research portfolio where scientists on the team, including myself and Rodolfo, as well as my colleague Nikki, who I'm certain many of you have worked with before, identify research gaps through our advocacy, and then we work closely with scientists and other organizations to jointly support these critical research project projects. So moving to marine protected areas. In 2002, as many probably know, CAMLAR became the first international body to commit to creating a network of MPAs. And then they developed these nine uh, regional planning domains in 2011 to help ensure that the creation of this MPA network would be representative. The first CAMLAR MPA to be designated was South Orkney Island's Southern Shelf MPA in 2009. 
And then the second was the Ross Sea Region MPA in 2016, which is the largest protected area in the world. Currently, there's three additional protected areas being considered. These include the East Antarctic, the Weddell Sea, and the Antarctic Peninsula. In addition, uh, there are a handful of national MPAs in the Southern Ocean, as you can see from our map. Our Pew Bertarelli Ocean Legacy Program has been particularly active in the South Georgia and South Sandwich Islands region, advocating for increased protection of nearby waters and also supporting research that looks at the overlap of penguin foraging habitat and krill fishing, and as well collaborating with the Uni University of Oxford to explore climate impacts on ecosystem services. Of the three current proposals considered by CAMLAR, the West Antarctic Peninsula is a key area for, pr for protection. As you know, given disproportionate warming sea and air temperatures, the region, loss of sea ice, and changing weather patterns. Also has the highest human footprint in the Antarctic region, has the most research stations and bases, vast majority of tourism with upwards of 50,000 tourists a year, obviously not this year. Um, and additionally, the krill fishing is increasingly concentrated in this area. So the process to propose the Antarctic Peninsula MPA is notable for how inclusive and participatory and also transparent it has been, which has helped increase stakeholder buy-in at early stages. There were two workshops held that brought together policymakers, scientists, and other stakeholders. Over 170 data layers were analyzed to identify areas of ecological significance, which I believe Cesar will touch on uh, in his next presentation. And there's also numerous technical meetings and discussions held at CAMLAR working group meetings. And Argentina and Chile created an expert group which offered a mechanism for direct participation of CAMLAR scientists, but it also allowed for the participation of civil society and industry, a first for these processes. Pew has been deeply involved in this entire proposal process, including providing technical support on marks and analyses to uh, build capacity for the development of the MPA, and then also funding research on species and ecosystems to help inform where the boundaries of the MPA should be located. The D1 MPA, as it is also called, and the other CAMLAR MPA proposals are firmly underpinned by the best available science. Based on these recommendations, the commission then considers their designation. However, while ultimately decisions are informed by science, they are also very political in nature and require considerable buy-in from both proponent country governments as well as other CAMLAR members in order to secure their creation. So we do a lot of policy advocacy on our program, which builds off the technical and scientific side of these MPAs, but it also recognizes that the 26 members of CAMLAR have different national and geopolitical interests that impact how these MPAs are viewed. So we are working to bridge this gap between science, policy, and then politics through connecting scientists with policymakers, providing technical and strategic support for proponent countries, and proponent countries are the countries that um, have introduced these proposals to CAMLAR, and then conducting global communication activities and participating in expeditions. On this latter point, in January 2019, Antarctica 2020 champions Pascal Lamy, who is the former head of the WTO, Jose Mira Figueres, the former president of Costa Rica, and then of course the legendary uh, marine explorer Sylvia Earle, traveled to the Antarctic Peninsula with Chilean President Piñera and met with him several times about the MPA. That's the picture in the middle there. Uh, this outreach helped raise the profile about the Antarctic Peninsula MPA, and it led to President Panier speaking with President Xi of China about the MPA and also an agreement to collaborate with China on Antarctic science moving forward. So we've been undertaking outreach such as this to Chinese and Russian officials because they have voiced concerns about the marine protected areas in Antarctica and are the remaining hurdle to achieving consensus for the peninsula region. And while COVID, of course, has made this outreach more difficult, we see this continued policy engagement as one of the major efforts that is needed to designate an MPA in the peninsula region. Of course, design and designation are only the first steps in guaranteeing a marine protected area realizes its conservation goals. In addition to the need for monitoring and enforcement after the MPA is designated, sustainably managing the resources outside of the MPA is also very critical. So for the peninsula region, of course, this means sustainable management of Antarctic krill. Krill comprises the majority of the fisheries catch in Kamlar waters with over 312,000 tons landed in 2018. This catch is increasingly concentrated uh, in the ecologically important areas around the Western Antarctic Peninsula, as you can see from the map, which shows the number of years of krill fishing between 2013 and 2017 overlaid with the current boundaries of the MPA. 
We are really at a pivotal moment for achieving this ecosystem-based management system for the krill fisheries. MPU is working with CAMLAR delegation members, several scientists on this call, and industry to harmonize the MPA and fisheries management processes. Uh, as a bit of background, in 2009, CAMLAR put in place an interim conservation measure to regulate the krill fishery. This measure has been renewed every two years. It always required a bit of a political fight to be renewed. However, in 2016, CAMLAR renewed the measure for five years, which allows time to develop a science-based management system. The next step leading to this ecosystem-based management is to fully implement the work plan when the interim measure expires in 2021. So three main components of this plan are revised krill biomass estimate, updated stock assessment to such catch limits, and a risk assessment. The survey and stock assessment haven't been updated in 20 years, even though this has been obviously a period of rapid environmental change and social change. And the risk assessment is the component that will really make for a truly ecosystem-based management system by spreading catches out to minimize impacts on predators. So from that map that we saw previously, making sure that the krill fishing is not quite as concentrated. So Pew is supporting this work through convening stakeholders across science, industry, and NGOs, funding research to ensure the plan provides ecosystem protection. My colleague Rodolfo, who is joining me for the Q&A, has been working very closely on these issues and he can answer any of the technical questions you have during the Q&A. And so finally, although Pew has been engaged in this work for over a decade, uh, there is always room for improvement. Communication across science, policy, and politics is challenging, and we want to keep these lines of communication open to ensure we stay on top of current research as well as political concerns. In particular, as CAMLAR member stations move forward considering new MPA proposals and scientists increasing, like yourselves, increasingly understand the dynamics of Southern Ocean ecosystems and climate, we want to hear from you how we can better support conservation efforts in the region. So thank you again for having me speak today and uh, my colleague and Rodolfo and I are happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks. Uh, that, that's great. There is already a question in the box. I don't know if you can see in the Q&A. Uh, so maybe if you can answer that first. Uh, you want me to go uh, then? Yes, yes, please go. Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Rodolfo Werner, as Anne already mentioned and happy to be here and, and talk to you guys. Um, I'm just reading here the question by Patrick. Or Patrick. Um, I mean, I would say that depending, like, like Anne uh, mentioned, they're, they're in place like two marine protected areas right now for the South Oni Islands and one for the Ross Sea. Uh, I would say that they're different in, in the, the way the, the issues that are being permitted or not. And so I would say, depending on the marine protected area that's being proposed, the area, the activities in the area, the research that is being conducted there, the proposal will vary. Uh, and so in, in some cases, you will have some areas which will be defined as no take. So with no activity, no research, no uh, fishing will take place. Some other areas, they will be devoted to some kind of research fishing. And, but, at the end of the day, um, it depends on the on the specific uh, proposal. For example, in the case of the marine protected area that has been, been, has been proposed for the domain one for the Antarctic Peninsula, we've been going through a series of um, changes in the proposal. So we had an original uh, proposal that had like three different types of zones. One that was a no take, one that included some kind of research fishing, and and the third one that allowed some, some fishing under the current conservation measures, which are the regulations uh, that apply to the fishery. Uh, this has been changed and now we're getting, uh, the proposal has been developed into a proposal that has only two types of uh, zones, ones, one er some areas that are no take and some are areas in where fishing will be allowed following the uh, conservation measures. So um, just to, trying to be brief, it really depends on the individual marine protected areas uh, and the zoning that will be proposed and agreed, and also uh, the activities that will be allowed in the different zones. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. 
And I've put up a map of the um, Antarctic Peninsula proposal and the areas that are dotted line are the krill fishery zone and then the solid lines are the general protection zones. I have a question. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting. You, uh, you mentioned at one point that one of the primary activities of Pew um, was to talk to Kamala about integrating climate change into their mm -hmm. decision making. Mm -hmm. That struck me that to uh, this audience, that might come as a surprise that that's not already included in the decision <laughs> of Kamala. I wonder if you could comment on that and perhaps explain a little bit more about how you're proposing integrating climate change. So um, a few years ago, there is actually a paper, um, and apologies if I botch who the authors are, but I believe it was Australia um, and the UK and perhaps New Zealand who proposed this climate change response work program. So this was an initiative that um, took several years, was very comprehensive, looking at all the ways that climate change could be integrated into decision making from new research that needed to be done to um, how to incorporate, um, adaptively incorporated assessments of species populations into management decisions. Unfortunately, because Kamala operates on consensus, this was not agreed to. Uh, last year, there was also a non-binding resolution that was proposed um, to do to again incorporate climate change into Camelot decision making also not agreed to. And so at this point, we're encouraging countries to really, um, Camelot member nations to really take some of these suggestions from the climate change response work program uh, into their own work as moving forward. So if there's parts of the program that they can um, independently undertake that will help uh, it, take into consideration climate change more and more into Kamlar discussions and into decision making, then hopefully that will make the um, response work program a bit more palatable in the future. Uh, but of course, I mean, it is a consensus based body. So um, lots of, as I mentioned, geopolitics go into these con considerations. And so that is something that we keep in mind when encouraging countries to um, you know, stay on top of the lid of science and really be precautionary because Kamler was founded on the idea of the precautionary principle. And so really be precautionary in the management of these resources as we learn more about climate change moving forward. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, uh, and now for the last question, I'm going to, to read the questions because apparently there is some delay. So uh, Kim is asking uh, if the protect areas are planning in the future to be uh, expand to cover also offshore waters because that's where most of the female krill spawn during summer. So that's the last question. And for those of you, because sorry, I forgot before, uh, if you have any questions that we don't have the time now to answer, please write it down or something like that, because at the end we will have an open forum and that will be probably the best place to keep those popping all these questions so we can start the conversation. So please, Anne. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, That's a great question. Um, the boundaries of the current three proposal are unlikely to change. So we have the Antarctic Peninsula, um, the Weddell Sea, although Norway is um, developing a proposal for um, to the right of the Prime Meridian. I'm not sure if we would consider that east. And then also the East Antarctic Peninsula, which has been around for nine years now. So those are unlikely to change. Um, there are two planning domains. If I can go back to some other maps. Um, there are two planning domains, domain four and domain nine, which currently don't have Kamlar proposals within them. Um, so there is the possibility there that an offshore MPA could be developed, but I'm not certain and also do not think that the as krill are concentrated in domain one that those boundaries are likely to change very much but Rodolfo can um, speak to that as well yeah yeah I wanted to add something thank you Anne um, and I guess um, I think that probably Kim is referring I guess to the areas of um, to the west of the Antarctic Peninsula and in the map, I think that you showed, which was a, a part of the MPA proposal, the, the two large uh, closed zones, no take areas in the south uh, were not included. And these are two large areas that has been, they have been proposed to be no take exactly 
to pr uh, protect those krill spawning areas um, for, I mean, for krill, of course, and which are kind of south and, and more offshore. Uh, if, that, if those are the areas that Kim, you are referring, they are part of the proposal. If you're referring to some other areas that might be offshore from the South Orkney Island, sorry, from the South Shetland Islands, um, there have been uh, no uh, uh, proposed for, for those areas, but these are areas that the fishery um, is not operating, where the fish is not operating, and I don't think it will be operating in the, in the future. They're normally trying to operate in more coastal areas. Okay, uh, thanks for the, for the talk again and the great Q&A. And now, if we may, uh, now is the time for Cesar Cárdenas from INACH in Chile. Uh, Cesar is going to talk about the MPA proposal specifically for the domain one. So please, uh, Cesar, if you may share your screen. Okay, there you go. So please, uh, Cesar, whenever you go, you have five minutes. Thanks, uh, Juan. Yeah, I think I've accumulated some flying time on Zoom after the camera meeting, so I'm more than ready. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for that uh, and for that uh, presentation. I think that that's a very good uh, link. So, um, yeah, you have addressed a lot of things I'm hoping that you will address. So that, that that's a perfect uh, match, I think. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Cesar Cárdenas. I'm a, a researcher from the Chilean Antarctic Institute. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to briefly present uh, some of the work we've been developing since two, uh, since 2012 uh, on behalf of uh, the whole uh, uh, Domain 1 MPA um, team. <clears throat> so yeah, um, as we know, uh, the Western Antarctic uh, Peninsula is changing. And uh, yeah, but it's, uh, even though, as um, we saw the first uh, presentation, there is still a lot of uh, uncertainties that we need to address, but uh, we, we can all agree that the, the area is changing and it's producing, it's, it's, it's influencing the biota um, uh, um, and the ecologic also uh, environment and the benthic one. And uh, the good news was that Kamala agreed to establish uh, an MPA network as, as we just uh, heard. So uh, the main issue in the peninsula, apart from the, of, of course, all, all the environmental changes that <clears throat> are occurring, uh, it's the main hotspot hot of, or it's the main area where the uh, krill fishery occurs. Uh, this is a, a graph that uh, uh, showing all the catches from before, before the establishment of camera until uh, 2008. And as we can see, um, the, the fishery has been uh, well managed, uh, although we can see there is an increase like um, in the last uh, decades, uh, we're now reaching, and then actually the new, the last year, the 2019 will reach uh, a high, which is, will be uh, 400,000 uh, tons, which is uh, some of the catches that we saw in uh, back in 86. So uh, the main problem is that all this, uh, catches are occurring mainly here in uh, sub area 48 uh, 1 and 48 uh, 2 which is uh, the domain one <clears throat> so as was uh, mentioned uh, uh, before this process started in uh, in 2012 with with uh, uh, with some workshops where uh, the uh, conservation objectives were agreed and the levels of protection and uh, this uh, this um, process took a, a new level in in 2017 when a, a preliminary proposal was um, uh, presented in the commission. And then uh, there was a formal pr proposal in in 2018, which was uh, which uh, did not uh, reach a consensus, as as we hear. And then after a, a process of uh, 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 dis discussing several issues with, with uh, civil society, including industry, ONGs, and all the uh, interested members, we presented a, a um, revised uh, conservation measure in, uh, in 2019. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the objectives, but it, this is just to, uh, you can, so that you can have a, a better idea of, of what we're trying to, 
to to protect uh, and this is also related with the question the first question that was uh, asked there, there are like uh, many objectives uh, some of them related to pelagic uh, uh, habitats or processes and also benthic and important areas for 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 other uh, organisms so it's it's more about like it's not all about krill and, and uh, penguins is uh, it tries to protect the whole uh, the entire uh, ecosystem so this was the the first uh, when we when we uh, proposed the uh, priority areas for conservations which are in blue this was this the sum of uh, of all the uh, objectives that we were aiming to to protect and as you see you see in the northern part of the of the uh, uh, Western Antarctic Peninsula, the northern part is a huge area. It's, ma it's more related with, with the areas as the name uh, suggests. It's more about the foraging grounds for several uh, uh, animals. And then other areas were more, more related to other objectives. And as you see, the three most uh, southern ones were uh, like smaller areas. And so the one of them, for example, the southern most one was more related to the only uh, colony of uh, emperor peruins in, in that area. Uh, so after uh, the, a lot of discussions, we tried to simplify the, the model. In, in we uh, the, the first one was more about uh, coastal buffer zones, and then we tried to introduce some uh, research area, as uh, Rodolfo mentioned. <clears throat> but then uh, we tried to simplify the the method. Uh, still achieving the conservation objectives and uh, and um, also increasing the the protection in some of the areas. So if, if you see this one, the southern part compared with the previous one, it's it's bigger. And uh, trying to achieve to increase the protection of other objectives, like like we 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 hear, for example, the protection of uh, lar or krill uh, larval uh, stages. So the basically in terms of what we're trying to protect the the in the area in orange um, that that's a, a, an area where the like, fishing uh, uh, fleet can operate, and the blue one it's uh, basically a no no take zone, so uh, the, there won't be a critical fishery. And uh, there's also a, 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 a another another um, level of protection in the um, orange area in for the benthic uh, habitats. Although the the krill uh, fishing fleet operates in in shallower waters, there is some evidence that sometimes they can uh, reach the bottom. So we try to also to uh, increase the protection in that uh, regard. This is more or less uh, what what what's going on now. Uh, we we know that it's uh, the the concentration is uh, increasing, and, and this is a comparison between in a decade, and you can see in the uh, right bottom one. This is what's what, what's going on now. What has been occurring in the last uh, ten years, where the fisheries it's heavily concentrated in the Bransfield Strait and in the Gerla Strait. So now there is more evidence. Uh, different studies have reached like similar uh, conclusions that uh, there is there might be a, ne a negative effect of of the of the krill fishery in years on with particular uh, uh, climatic uh, conditions. So just to <clears throat> sum up, um, as, as, as you can see, the proposal aims to achieve protection of conservation objectives, also recognizing the need to, to contemplate uh, human uh, activities, in this case, it's mainly uh, uh, krill fishing. Um, fortunately, now Kamala has acknowledged the need for a new management approach, taking into account that the, the, the concentration and the caches are, are, in, are increasing. So this is important. And I think we that is uh, helping uh, has is highlighting the 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 work that we has have been developing. So um, this is really important. The new evidence that has, has uh, been published in, in recent years, like like the mention that the, the one that I mentioned in the previous one about the effects of of, of krill fishery, it's very important. And also other study by by other scientists from other countries, not not only from from Chile and Argentina. I think that that's a huge support for us, and it's really really important to highlight. Um, most of the time, we get questions as uh, do you need more data to include in the model? And and we we are not doing that, but we are really encouraging other other uh, scientists to 
to let us know if there is a, a new a new study or something that can highlight some of the areas that we're trying to protect. And uh, I think that that has been really important to show the importance of of the areas so or the zones that we are trying to to uh, protect. So um, new 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 evidence it's really making I think the the D1 MPA stronger. And uh, hopefully, uh, as we hear, uh, we will try to um, reach consensus uh, soon. And uh, we, we, we can get this uh, MPA uh, approved. Uh, so once again, thanks on behalf of the, the whole uh, Domain 1 MPA, uh, Mercedes from, from Argentina, and also my colleagues from Ninet, and of course, all, all the other scientists from, from other countries that have been uh, involved in this proposal. Thanks a lot, and thanks for, uh, I hope you liked the uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tessa. Uh, really good. So we are a little bit tight on time, so we have time for one question, if anyone wants to do it. Okay, so it seems like, well, if we have any question, uh, please keep it for the open forum. So now uh, we have uh, Marina, uh, who is a uh, talking about eddies and gliders. So please, Marina, if you can share your screen. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. If you yeah. can make it full size. Like a presentation yeah. mode? Yes. Okay, that's perfect. So five minutes, okay. the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Marina Zaneo. I work with Karen Haywood at UGA. And I just wanted to show you today some very preliminary, show a very preliminary view of this data that we have uh, for more channel observations of this um, standing eddy of the top of the ridge that we did by gliders. So in 2012, as part of the Gentle project, we deployed a glide, two gliders for up to two months in the South East Coastal Ridge. And as it was a multidisciplinary study, we also had some CCD, some uh, water, some samples, nutrient measurements, and so on. And we wanted to look at the productivity in the region and the static growth front. This was a very, and um, we saw some very interesting features. And uh, during this study, casually, the glider uh, crossed uh, this um, anticyclonic standing eddy over the, the ridge. So we knew this eddy existed, but we were not particularly interested on that uh, in this study, particularly. Um, so for example, the CTD stations that we had, they didn't happen uh, concomitantly with the gliders and so on. But we still managed to see some very interesting features. Um, so uh, we've been in the, so these are briefly the glider sections, and this section 10 is the section that crossed the eddy over the South Social Ridge. And um, so we saw uh, the eddy had some, combining all the information we had, all the data sets, we saw that the eddy had about 40 kilometers diameter, uh, combining the city day stations and all the rest of the information, we saw that the eddy had a colder temperature in the core, lower chlorophyll, and then we also saw this modest increase in the crew on the edges of the eddy. And we also saw lots of resuspension, transport of sediments, so some very nice, interesting features associated with the eddy. Um, but as I said, that wasn't the main feature. So we decided that we wanted to go there and revisit this place um, with some more focused sampling. So uh, in February this year, we, we went back and, uh, sorry, I think I skipped one of the slides here. Yeah, so in February this year, we, as a collaboration between uh, the Brazilian Highlights Food Group and uh, UEA, and also partially funded by the Antarctic Science International Bursary and the Compass Project, we decided to go back and do a cruise that was more focused on, on the ad itself. So we kept some um, monitoring of the region 
and we wanted to do all our strategic stations and all the other measurements, trying to cross the eddy as many as we could. And uh, it was quite interesting because obviously by monitoring the eddy, we saw the amount of variability that happens in this region in terms of the physical processes. And specifically, this area has a very high spatial and temporal variability. And that's what we're interested on. We wanted to look at how this was affecting the primary productivity in this region, which is already so chaotic with a mix of um, water methods from so many regions. And so we wanted to see how this process, the physical processes related with the area were then impacting the primary productivity through mixing and resupply of nutrients. So we planned the cruise to cross the eddy, and then we went there in uh, February this year. Uh, and we managed to do um, 10 days deployment. Uh, it was the maximum we could stay because the weather changed a lot. Uh, but then we managed to get 290 profiles. Uh, it was a very interesting place to measure with the sea ice um, coming up and the weather being a little bit of a drifter on the hands of the tide. Uh, but it was still a very interesting experiment, and we, man we managed to get two full drone sets back and forth of the eddy. Um, and then just as a very preliminary view of what we had, uh, what, what we sampled. Um, so this is basically the, the first crossing of the eddy. This triangle shows the eastern edge, and then this is the second crossing of the eddy back and forth. And then we, we can see very clearly the signature of adding our section, so the lower temperature, we saw the lower chlorophyll, so this that is quite, um, between several different years, we can see this feature very well defined. Uh, we also saw that, you know, the decrease, the absence of the high chlorophyll of the surface, the vertical mixing, and um, yeah, so very interesting features. None of this data is um, calibrated so far, um, so it's a very, still very uh, initial stage of the, of looking at the data, and um, so this this lot of data is my baby. But our goal obviously is to combine this with the whole data set, the whole biological data set from the cruise, uh, with the specific stations, with the samples of the nutrients, and particularly for me with the lower DCP and the sheep DCP. And the goal then is to look at the very small features and the, the role of the horizontal, of the shear instabilities in setting up uh, the productivity in the region and the variability between the crossings. And it's very fine scales, spatial and temporal scales. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Marina. I think that we have someone with a raised hand. So uh, now you can talk. Please go, Alex. Yeah. Uh, you can speak now, uh, Alex. You can. Uh, sorry. Um, yourself. Hey, sorry, yeah. sorry yeah. can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Go. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Sorry, sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, nice little talk. Um, and really nice to see that data, that you got some good data from that um, experiment. Um, I'm just wondering uh, why you perceive this to be a standing eddy rather than, do you think it's a standing eddy or do you think it's a Taylor column? Um, because it seems to have very much the hallmarks of kind of water retention um, and kind of Taylor column dynamics. So I just wondered, yeah, I just wonder why why you thought particularly a standing eddy uh, as yeah. opposed to yeah. So um, so this eddy has been described uh, mainly in Andy's previous articles uh, with drifters, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, he describes it as a standing eddy and so on. Uh, but we obviously we based our study considering that. But I, I'm still really early on to actually define what that is. I, I intend now with all the chief ADCP, the ADCP data and so on to actually have a closer look and see the physical properties and, and define it properly. So, so far what we had was just basically drifters, uh, drifter information. So I, I, we believe it's a standing eddy uh, uh, for its consistency and so on. 
but we I'm still gonna actually look further into that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it looks pretty nice. I mean, the, the, the backscatter signal that you're getting, the kind of mixing signal, probably looks like there's some internal tidal signal within that, if you think it's a strong internal yeah. tidal. It looks like there may be kind of propagating beams coming from the topography even. So, um, yeah, I'd be really interested to see more of this. So, nice. Yeah. Really this, again, this is not um, processed at all, right? It's no, no, very I, I, no, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I still need to look, but um, from what I saw from the Genso data set, which yeah. then I looked a little bit further into, into the backscatter, and then I calculated uh, POC and all the more interesting biological information. Uh, yeah. There is a lot of virtual mix, a lot of interesting things happening. Yeah, the signal is real, let's say. All right, that's great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Alex, for the great question. So now we have a last uh, question for you, Marina, and Diego is asking uh, what the backscatter signal represents in the data. Yeah, so the backscatter, again, um, this is not clean and it's not um, calibrated. So this can be uh, sediment, this can be um, uh, uh, organic carbon, this can be all sorts of things which we have to actually uh, calibrate and do the proper calculations. This is just a very raw um, data set, the very raw measurements. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, Marina, for a great talk. Uh, now we have, I think it's Ryan, let me check. Yeah, uh, Ryan is going to talk about turbulent mixing in the WAP. So please, Ryan, if you can share your screen. Can you, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah, go. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Scott, and I'm a final year PhD student at the British Antarctic Survey and my PhD is also linked with the University of Southampton. So I've been working most closely with Alex Brearley at Bass um, and this presentation uh, just shows some of my results from my PhD where I've used a Slocum glider to look at um, mixing within Ryder Bay and I've revealed a two-stage upward heat flux within Ryder Bay. So Ryder Bay is situated on the southeast coast of Adelaide Island, which is on the, obviously on the West Antarctic Peninsula. Um, it's bounded to the north by Sheldon Glacier, which is a marine terminating glacier that's retreating, um, and to the south by Le Bouf Fjord, um, which is here on this map. And you, as you can see, that it's um, connected to Marguerite Trough, and so it's kind of connected to the uh, open ocean. So in 2016, we deployed a glider um, for about one and a half months. Um, and the glider was equipped with a microstructure package and also a CTD sensor. Um, and the, gl the glider was set to do set multiple transects into and out of the bay. And you can see that um, it spans over this shallower region, which is a topographic ridge at the bay's entrance. And, and this has a depth of around 300 meters. But also over this uh, deeper part of the bay, which has a depth of around 520 meters. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you some mean sections in a second, um, which are basically taken along this A to B transect. This location, uh, or this yellow dot here, shows the location of the ADCP mooring that was deployed in the same time period, um, which I've been using to aid my analysis. Um, and this red dot here represents uh, uh, the location of Rodra, which uh, also has a meteorological station, which I've been using to aid my analysis. Um, the, the fact that the, the bay has a ridge at the entrance and that it gets um, seasonally covered by sea ice and is close to this marine terminating glacier makes the bay, uh, it, or it makes the bay representative of many others uh, across the West Antarctic Peninsula. So the mechanisms or processes that I'm sort of looking at here could be applicable elsewhere. So this is a mean section of conservative temperature um, from the glider, again, from the A to B transect. Um, and you can use it to identify three water masses. So in the upper 50 meters, we've got this cold and it's also fresh Antarctic surface water. Um, and then below this, we've got a thin 20 to 30 meter thick layer of winter water, which has a temperature of around minus one degree C. And then this dashed line here represents the thermocline, um, which has a depth of around 130 meters. And then below that, we've got this warm and it's also saline circumpolar deep water. 
And this means that there's a reservoir of heat at depth, which can be available to mix upwards into the overlying waters. And to look at that process, we need to look at the dissipation estimates. So here is a, a mean section of dissipation um, from A to B. Um, and so at the surface, we've got elevated dissipation on the order of times 10 to the minus eight watts per kilogram. And this is what you would perhaps expect because there's an input of energy from the winds. Um, but then also you can see here over the, over the topographic ridge at the entrance to the bay, there's also elevated dissipation on the same order of magnitude uh, times 10 to the minus eight watts per kilogram. Um, and this is elevated with respect to above the deeper part of the basin where dissipation estimates are on the order of times 10 to the minus nine or 10. Um, so this elevated dissipation over the ridge actually occurs in, occurs in about 60% of the transects that the glider did from A to B. Um, and I don't have time to show it here, but um, I've attributed this to a hydraulic control. So another thing we can look at then are the associated heat fluxes. Um, so as I mentioned, the, 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 the heat fluxes well, as I mentioned, the, the, the dissipation over the ridge is associated with the hydraulic control, which is, this HC represents here. And you can see that in the cases where there is a hydraulic control, the heat fluxes are about four times larger um, over the ridge um, than compared to the, across the thermocline. So um, I've defined the, the, the across the thermocline uh, heat fluxes here as it, those it, within the 105 to 205 meter layer. So this means that there's an accumulation of heat at the base of the thermocline um, due to the heat fluxes over the ridge that then slowly get released into the overlying waters. However, if, if you uh, look at this heat flux over here across the base of the thermocline, on day 49, the, the heat flux was um, over double the, 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 compared to the mean. Um, and actually on this, on this day, there was a basin-wide dissipation event that released heat into the overlying water. So my last slide is just going to show you um, my investigation into what caused this basin-wide event. So the basin-wide dissipation event on day 49 I've attributed to wind-driven near inertial shear at the base of the thermocline. So the top panel is the wind stress magnitude. The, the middle panel here is the integrated near inertial shear within the 105 to 205 meter layer. And you can see that I've um, calculate a four day low pass filter of both these signals, which is these magenta lines. And if you look closely, you can see that there's about a 1.7 day lag between the near inertial shear peaks and the uh, peaks in the, in the wind stress. So once I've corrected for that lag, I then get statistically significant correlations of about, of about 0.46. So this suggests that the winds have some control on the near inertial shear. Um, but then looking um, to compare the shear with the dissipation. So looking at within this time period here is when we actually have mean dissipation estimates from the glider. Um, you can see that before day 41, um, there's a correlation of 0.48, um, which is statistically significant. And after day 43, there's a statistically significant correlation of 0.26. Now there are some differences such as around day 41. Um, which I still need to uh, think about a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so basically um, this shows that the winds have some control on the near inertial shear within Ryder Bay, um, and that shear can generate dissipation events, particularly around day 49. Um, and so this basin-wide dissipation event on this day, I've sort of suggested that it could be due to this very strong um, wind stress event on day 47. Okay, yeah, thank you very much and happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Really, really nice data set and really nice talk. So if we have still time for one or two questions. If... Oh. If there is some. Okay, so uh, thanks, Ryan. Well, uh, probably there will be questions popping up during the open yeah, forum. No so thank, thank you. you again. Uh,